Good morning, church. Pastor Paul here, and I just want to take an opportunity to welcome you to this very special Palm Sunday morning service. Uh, once again, we're worshiping in a little bit of a different way in order to abide by the most current recommendations of our local health unit. Uh, we've recorded this service in segments in order to strictly limit the number of people in the building at any one time. So we are not together in the body. Uh, but we can be together in the Spirit. The Apostle Paul talked about that several times in the New Testament. He said, for example, in Colossians 2.5, For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. So there is a sense in which we can be together this morning in the Spirit. Uh, it's, it's a different uh, experience for us. But we are still together, and we need to be together as we begin this journey towards the cross and the empty tomb. This is an important season for us as a church. Uh, and it will be different this year. Uh, this year will feel a little bit like Easter in exile. And that's okay. Uh, the church of God has worshipped in exile before. We know how to do this. And we believe that God is in this and that he has purposes for us in this. So thanks for being here. Thanks for pressing through. I'm sure some of you have uh, had your frustrations with the technology. We've had our frustrations with the technology, but thanks for pressing through. Thanks for making this a priority. Thanks for gathering your family together around the table today so that we can be together in spirit as we worship the Lord. So let's do that now. Let me pray for us and we'll carry on in our time of worship this morning. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, you don't change. Uh, things down here are changing, but you don't change. And Lord, you are a rock and a refuge. You are our fortress and our shelter. And Lord, we want to, to come inside this morning. We want to wrap ourselves inside these big eternal truths. We want to be reminded of who you are and who we are and how you have saved us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So Lord, as, as strange as this is, as strange as it feels, Lord, you are here. You are with us. And we pray that you would bind us together now with a cord that cannot be broken. We pray that in the Spirit, we, your body, would be gathered today before the throne and that we would see, that we would behold the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ and we would be changed and that people would be saved. Lord, I pray that people watching this service today would be gathered in spirit to the foot of the cross. Oh Lord, we would ask that that would be so. Uh, Lord, this, we would count this entire disruption a small cost indeed if it led to many souls across Aurelia being gathered into your presence, into your family through faith in Jesus Christ. So let that be true. Let it, let it happen even today and, and change us, we ask, by one degree of glory to the next into the same image as Jesus Christ as we contemplate and behold him and worship him together today. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Jody, I'll hand it over to you. Well, amen. As we have just heard, we are in Holy Weekend. Today is Palm Sunday. Good morning, church. It is so good that we can gather together through this online worship experience and join together and declare that Jesus Christ is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen? Amen. Well, today is a, a Holy Week beginning like perhaps we've never had before. I know we've never had one like this before. We're gathering together in different places and different homes, but we're here to declare that Jesus Christ is the Lord and he is the King. And uh, we want to raise our voices and lift up Christ in this place, in your home, every place that you find yourself today. We turn our eyes to him. Here's what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 19 about who Jesus is. It says this, on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. This is who Jesus is as he came into Jerusalem that day with palm branches waving, voices shouting, people declared that Jesus Christ was the King. Hosanna to him who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. And so we serve a great and an awesome King today. We bow low. We lift him high. In humility, we come and declare that our God is good, that he's in control. We worship him. We praise him. And we yield and surrender to him who is the King and him who is our Prince of Peace. It's Jesus. So would you join your voices with ours? Let's worship the Lord 
and exalt him today. All hail the power of Jesus' name. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. We've been chosen by him. Israel's race, he ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown Today we crown him Lord of all. Oh, that with yonder sacred throne we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song. celebrate today. Jesus Christ is the King. We sing Hosanna on this Palm Sunday. Praise is rising. Let's sing it. Well, praise is rising. Eyes are turning to you. We turn to When we see you, we find strength to face the day. Yes, in your presence, all our fears are washed away, washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, you're worthy of Welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Hear the sound of hearts returning to you. We turn to you 
make us new. Cause when we see you, when we find strength to face the day. Face the day in your presence, all our fears are washed away. we thank you that you are our one true king. And even though we're scattered everywhere around the world today, we know that our voices join together in praise and in prayer, along with the angels in heaven, in declaring you as our one true king and savior. And we admit that sometimes we look to other things as saviors, and our hope is not only in you. So please forgive us, and I pray that you would fix our eyes on you as our one true savior. Hosanna, God, we praise you and we thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Lord, come have your way among us today as we gather in this online worship experience. Hey, we have been learning how to do social distancing and getting better at it, and we're also learning how to do connecting with one another online in various ways. So thank you so much for all that you're doing to keep connected and to keep connected in your relationship with the Lord vertically and to keep connected with each other horizontally. And one of the ways that we can keep encouraged is by hearing stories of what God is doing around the world and in different parts, different ways that God is uh, stirring up people in different places just to, to be living out their faith. And this morning we have an opportunity to get an update from Dr. Craig. Pastor Paul and Dr. Craig are going to be talking about what's going on as the Brandon family prepares uh, to go to the mission field. So let's hear this, let's be encouraged, and let our faith be stirred up. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jody, and thank you, Dr. Craig, for being with us today. It's really good to be here. Well, Craig, as probably most of the people watching here today are aware, uh, you and your family, Renee and little Ellie, have been gearing up for yeah. a long-term uh, mission exposure to South Africa, mm -hmm. a mission trip that's more than a trip. It's uh, a five-year project. Yeah. And uh, we've been tracking with you as you have mm -hmm. faced hurdle after hurdle. We were cheering for you about a month ago mm -hmm. when the last big hurdle kind of went down and then all this happened. Yeah. And so we're just kind of wondering how you're doing. Mm. Uh, hope deferred makes the heart sick. So we're just wondering how you're mm. doing and mm. how we can be praying for you at this time. Oh, thanks, Pastor Paul. Uh, can I just say, wow, <laughs> because it's been such a incredible time of uh, confusion, but that's, yeah. that's a good place to be because it forces us to trust in the Lord. So yes, we had the um, uh, uh, documents were ready to be signed at the court yeah. on the 25th of March. Um, everything was going ahead. She's in our name, so we, we thank the Lord for that. Amen. And then this happened, and not only did the court shut down, the judge that was going to sign it retired. Oh, boy. Uh, yeah. And so what has happened is there will only be another judge coming into the court June, uh, June 10th or in the middle of June. 
So to be honest, I, we don't know where we stand right now uh, in terms of going. We wanted to go May 1st. Yeah. Uh, that was the idea. Um, it may be now September um, with, because it's not only the signing of the document, it's then a six week wait for the visa from the South African consulate um, uh, in, in uh, Toronto to, to, to go through. Uh, and then obviously then getting our, uh, 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 our belongings over to South Africa in a container. Uh, so that's where we're at right now. The good news is we are still connecting with the South African Church um, uh, just this morning. Uh, and it's gone, not only gone to the pastors in South Africa, also in Zimbabwe now. There's over 100 churches getting anything I write uh, regarding either biblical counseling or theological studies is going both to the South African pastors who are really encouraging. They're excited. They miss us and they want us yeah. to be there. Uh, but also now it's now the Lord has allowed us to go to Zimbabwe. So even though we've had to stay put, God is still using these things. Yeah. And as difficult as, as these <clears throat> delays have been for you, I mm. mean, obviously in the providence of God, it's, it's better that you're here, mm -hmm. um, you know, not putting additional strain on the health resources in South Africa right. here if, there, if, if there's any need for the health services mm -hmm. here. So God knows what he's doing, as hard as it is sometimes for us mm -hmm. to go through these things. And it's not just uh, what's happening here with this delay for us. Actually, South Africa is shut down. Yeah, that's right. Even more than we have. They're, they're yeah. in a, almost over a month. They're going to be shut down. So nothing will be processed. Yeah. And so they expect a backlog for at least another three months anyway there. Yeah. Um, and the transportation itself, yeah. um, whether it's shipping or whether it's flying, that's yeah. also been shut down. Yeah. Right on. Well, I know our people will want to be praying for yeah, you. Yeah. Uh, could you maybe give a couple bullet prayers that they could be uh, lifting up over the next couple of months? Yeah, I think patience all around. I'm a doer. Yeah. I like to get things accomplished. Yeah, for that we would be patient in God's timing. Right. Um, I've been reading uh, Calvin's sermons on Job. Yeah. And uh, so some of my very, very favorites. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And he was talking about the pure goodness of God in adversity. Yeah. And so the second would be um, that we would allow God to work in and through us right where we are here. The yeah. blessing of reaching our fellow brothers and sisters um, here at this church and then in our community yeah. and, 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 and uh, broader than that. And so that we would, and then um, also rejoicing. So a prayer of thanks okay. that God is good and God is wise and God is always on time. Yep, exactly right. Well, let me pray for you. Thank and you. I know our people will continue to do that as well over thank the next you. weeks and months. Thank you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this family. I thank mm -hmm. you that they're all in, uh, that uh, they're willing to go wherever you point them. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lord, I, I'm thankful for your wisdom as has been mentioned here, uh, as eager as they are to go. Lord, you always know things we don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, just another reminder not to chafe at, at your timing. Mm -hmm. uh, Lord, you, you see the whole board and mm -hmm. you know. And so I thank you that you have mm. been kind in your leadership of this family. I pray mm. that you'd give them great grace through this uh, difficult delay. Mm. Mm. And uh, then I just pray for all the logistics. Uh, when things open up, I pray mm. that they would go exceptionally smooth mm. and, uh, and you would have them arrive on time and mm. uh, ready to serve mm. and be useful. Mm. And in the meantime, Lord, use them in powerful ways here. We're so mm. thankful to have them uh, for as long as we do. Mm. And uh, we know they'll be a blessing to so many in our church and in our community. Mm. So mm. bless them, we pray. Watch over Renee and little Ellie as well. Mm. And uh, just uh, continue to encourage them during this difficult season. Mm. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. Thanks for being with us. Thank and you so much. Pastor Jody, we'll pass it back to you. Amen. Great to be encouraged. We just need to keep praying that the Lord will keep using us in all of the different ways that he's leading us. I've been thinking a lot about Psalm 9, verse 10. I love that verse. It says this, Those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Psalm 9, verse 10. And the more we know God, the more we can trust him. The easier it is for us to just be reminded that God is in control, that we can place our lives and our concerns and our worries in his hands. We just remember who Jesus is. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the King who comes to us in all these troubled times. In the Bible, in John chapter 14, Jesus gives us these wonderful words. 1427, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Isn't that a great verse? Don't be troubled today. Don't be afraid. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, is with him. He is a strong and mighty tower, and we can put our hope trust in him as we call upon him. His name is wonderful, beautiful. He's our Prince of Peace. Amen. As 
Well, good morning, Cornerstone Baptist, and good morning, Redeemer City Church. Uh, my name is, is Pastor Levi Denbach. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Cornerstone, and I lead the, the site campus at Redeemer. And it's a real privilege for me to open the Word of God with you today. And for Palm Sunday, we're going to be looking to Luke chapter 19. So I would invite you just to open your Bibles at home to Luke chapter 19, beginning in verse 28. Uh, and as you do that, I'll tell you, as I was studying through the text this week, I was reflecting on the fact that perhaps now more than ever in my life, I feel like I'm positioned to better hear and understand uh, what this passage is all about. This is a passage about peace, and it's a passage that goes out to the Jewish people who were a people who longed for peace. And I've read this, I've preached on this, but I, I think it's always rung a little empty with me because as a 30-year-old man living in Canada, I've known a very peaceful life. I haven't known what it's like to, to go through wartime. 
I haven't known what it's like to experience seasons of famine or pestilence. And perhaps now in the first time in my life, I'm experiencing just a little glimmer of that longing for God to restore his peace. I'm feeling that feeling of just wanting to snap my fingers and and make things as they were. Which is not to say that what we're going through right now is the same as Roman occupation. To be clear, it's not. But I think perhaps now more than ever, we are a people who are starting to feel that longing. The Israelites felt this. The Jewish people were, were a people who desperately longed for peace. And they saturated their lives with just these prayers for peace. They would greet one another with shalom, and that would be their farewell. They would sing songs of peace. I I think of Psalm 122, which was one of the songs of um, ascension. And so as they would ascend up to the temple with their family, they would would sing this song of worship together. And listen to what it's, it's centered around. As they approached Jerusalem, they sang these words, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be within you. Now, geographically, the Jews lived in a very dangerous place. They were surrounded by superpowers. They had Egypt to their south, Assyria to their north. At one point, they're brought into exile by the Babylonians. And then when they're brought out of exile, they're trampled upon by the Greeks And by the time Jesus comes onto the scene, they're living as a vassal state of the Roman Empire. These people were hungry for a return to peace, the peace of of King David and King Solomon's day. And they knew that that peace would come under the reign of a Messiah king. They believed that God would bring that king. And it is that sense of expectation that frames our text this morning. They're waiting for that king. And in Jesus, they received that king. But as we see in the text, I'm going to break this into two episodes. We've got the arrival of the king, uh, but then tragically, we're going to see that the king is rejected. Look with me now to the text, beginning at verse 28, as the king arrives. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. I want to pause there very quickly because Luke is drawing our attention back to the things that Jesus has just said, which means Luke is telling us that the things that he has said are going to help us to understand this story. So I want to just take a quick moment and flip back. What had Jesus just said? Well, if you look at verse 11, Jesus frames this parable that he's about to share, and it says this, as they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable. Why? Because he was near to Jerusalem and because they supposed that the kingdom of God was to appear immediately. So just stop there. So Jesus is approaching Jerusalem, but he knows that his disciples have some some false assumptions about what that's going to look like. The disciples are expecting that Jesus is going to take his throne, that he's going to overthrow the Romans, and that he's going to bring about the peace that they have been longing for since they were little boys. And so Jesus tells them a story, a story about delay, a story about a master who goes away for a very long time, and about how people need to work for the master, expecting his delayed return. So Jesus here is is preparing his disciples to to challenge their false assumptions. And Luke wants us to see that. Luke is tying the stories together, which means that we need to come into this with the right focus, longing to see Jesus as we should. Get back into the text with me now. Look with me at verse 29. It says, When he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. So let's just stop there and make sure we're understanding what we're, what we're seeing here in the text. 
because the Jewish people understood it. If you've ever sat in a sermon for Palm Sunday, uh, you know what's going on here. But just in case you're missing it, Jesus here is not looking for an easier mode of transportation to Jerusalem. This isn't a, a first century Uber call. Jesus isn't tired. Jesus is here making a bold and clear statement that he is the king. He is the king. And he's doing that by acting out the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9. 9. That was a prophecy that pointed forward to the king that the, the Israelites were expecting. And in that prophecy, listen closely to what it says. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. You hear that? This Messiah is going to come to you on a colt. And so Jesus, as he begins to approach Jerusalem, says to his disciples, go get me that colt. Everybody understood what Jesus was saying here. It's important that we understand as well. But before we move on, I also want to ask the question, why a donkey? Like, isn't that interesting? Why is it that Zechariah 9.9 doesn't talk about the king coming in on a war horse or, or, a, or an elephant, something majestic, something powerful for battle? Why a donkey? You don't ride a donkey into war. It, it's an animal for peacetime, which is the point. Jesus says, I'm not coming here to fulfill your, your military or your political expectations. I'm going to bring peace, but I'm not going to bring it with the sword. That is, that's the message that is built right into the prophecy. Now, of course, the people missed that element of the prophecy, but Jesus is showing them that he is the king of peace. Now, let's look ahead and consider his arrival. Look at verse 36. It says, and as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Now let's pause there because this is a significant moment. Up until this point in Luke's gospel, Jesus has been holding back his identity as the king. Now we read through various gospels that there were times when the crowds would, would want to make Jesus the king and they'd, they'd come to, to appoint him, but he would slip out through the crowd because the timing wasn't right. He knew that they had all these wrong assumptions and so he, he wasn't going to do that. But here, as he makes this entrance, in spite of the fact that the crowd still has all the wrong assumptions, in spite of all of that, Jesus says, no, it's right that they rejoice. It's right that they shout. Because if they didn't shout, the rocks would shout. Because Zechariah 9.9 is being fulfilled right now. The king is here. I love that. Now, unfortunately, while Jesus was initially met with shouting and acclamation, Jerusalem would not ultimately accept the return of her king, which is the next scene that we see in the text. We see that the king is rejected. I want you to look with me now at verse 41. <laughs> and when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they're hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Now let's stop. Luke is the only gospel writer to include this story. Uh, Leon Morris notes, This short section is peculiar to Luke. It shows that Jesus knew what the enthusiasm he was witnessing was worth. He knew what the enthusiasm was worth. That brings to mind 
Uh, the time when Jesus said, you know, many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not say many mighty works in your name? And I will say to them, away from me, I never knew you. This crowd has got all of this enthusiasm. They're excited for the arrival of the king. But here's the problem. They're not excited for Jesus. They're excited for the king of their imagination. They're excited for the king who's going who's gonna to fulfill all of these ideas that they have in their mind. But as Jesus' ministry goes on, they come to realize that Jesus, Jesus isn't playing by our rule book. Jesus isn't doing all of the things that we had expected And so the cloud separates, and the rejoicing is silenced, and the king is rejected. A.I. or I. Howard Marshall says, the city could have learned the way of peace from his teaching, but it would fail to recognize in his coming the gracious presence of God, offering the last opportunity of repentance. And this rejection resulted in tragic judgment. Jesus knew what that enthusiasm was worth. And and listen, I want you to see this. He knew what it was worth, and he wept. He wept. I don't know about you, but when I read my Bible, I'll often just pull a text and just make sure that I'm adding that to my mental picture of who God is. Because I don't want to worship the God of my imagination. I want to worship God for who he truly is. And I hope that you're adding this picture to your mind. Jesus doesn't look out over Jerusalem with anger, right? He's not annoyed that they don't see him. He's not annoyed that they're not surrendering themselves to him. Jesus sees that their rejection is going to lead to judgment, and Jesus weeps over the people. He weeps over them. The apostle Peter says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. That's who our God is. I hope that you're seeing that this morning. Now, we're going to unpack that a little later, but for now, I want to move on to the final section of our text today, which is beginning in verse 45. It says this, And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer. but you have made it a den of robbers. And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him, but they did not find anything they could do. For all the people were hanging on his words. Now in this final scene in our text, Jesus enters the temple and he purifies the temple. Because when he gets there, he sees the merchants who are buying and selling and trading, and they're doing all of this in the outer court of the Gentiles. Now, in in the worship of Jerusalem, there needed to be some buying and selling and trading. Many families traveled for miles and miles, and some of them are sacrificing uh, doves and pigeons. Some of them are sacrificing goats and sheep. And you can imagine traveling for 10 miles carrying a sheep. It would be exhausting. And so many of these families, they come with their local currency, and they get to Jerusalem, and they they exchange the currency. They buy what they need to buy for their sacrifices. So that, that was needed. What was unnecessary was for them to set up those markets in the court of the Gentiles. The court of the Gentiles was the outermost court of the temple where God had designed that there be a place for non-Jewish worshipers, people like you and me, to gather together to pray and to worship. It was to be a house of prayer for all nations. But because of this, the merchants and because of the buying and selling, Gentile couples are traveling for miles and they're getting to the temple, but they can't pray because there's, they're essentially in the middle of a Costco on Saturday. Right? You can imagine trying to conduct a prayer meeting in aisle five. It's noisy, it's cluttered, and Jesus is furious. And with righteous anger, he expelled the merchants from the court. Because he's the king and the king can do that. But that bothered, obviously, the religious leaders. Uh, More than that, we're told it bothered the prominent men of the city. And by the end of this scene, as Jesus is teaching in the temple, they have a settled antagonism towards Jesus, and they're seeking to destroy him. That's our text this morning. The king arrived, and he offered one last opportunity for repentance. 
He offered to lead his people into lasting peace, but they would not have him. The city that prayed for peace rejected him when he knocked on their door. Now, with the time we have left, I want to consider this text, and I want to pull out four warnings and implications for us today. The first warning is this, and this is the warning of the text. Hope you hear this. It's the danger of false assumptions. That's the main point in today's text. We should be leaving these pages asking the question, how is it possible that people who studied the word of God, people who prayed about peace and sang about peace and longed for peace could have the Prince of Peace knocking on their door and yet reject him? How is it possible when they listened as Jesus taught like no one they'd ever heard before? And they watched as Jesus performed signs and miracles that they'd never seen before. And with every step, seemingly, Jesus was fulfilling Old Testament prophecy after prophecy. He's even raising people from the dead. But they did not receive him. We should come away from this asking, how can that be? Well, humanly speaking, it's because Jesus didn't fit into the box that they had fashioned for him. See, they had taken the the promises and the truths of the Old Testament, but then they had also added their own cultural desires, their own political agenda, and so they had created this Messiah figure, and they were excited for that figure. And when Jesus came, they thought, perhaps he is the one. But as Jesus revealed himself and as Jesus went about his ministry, slowly but surely they realized he's not going to conform to our plan for him. Jesus isn't, Jesus isn't going to, to play the role that we've written for him in our script. And so they rejected him because of their false assumptions. That is dangerous, friends. And here's, I want you to hear this because this is not just a problem for first century Judaism. This is a problem for each and every one of us. That we come with false ideas, false assumptions, dangerous expectations about how Jesus is going to conform himself to our expectations. And that can keep us from seeing the truth. I would even say that there are people listening today who have not yet surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ because because they're afraid to take him on his terms. You have an idea of Jesus. You have a picture of Jesus. But that Jesus looks a lot more like you than he does like what we see in scriptures. You have a Canadian Jesus, a a Jesus who, who wants to just make you feel better immediately. But the Jesus of Scripture says, take up your cross and follow me. Jesus says, in this world, you will have tribulation. We have this idea of Jesus, almost like he's a genie in a bottle. And he's going to come and he's going to make life easier for us. He's going to make life better for us. And then we're going to put him back in the bottle because genies don't get to tell us what to do. And that's true. But Jesus isn't a genie. He's the king. And he's your king. And if we would have the peace that he offers, we need to surrender ourselves to Jesus for who he is, not for the idol of who we've made him out to be in our minds. Jesus is not just one way of many that leads to heaven. No, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is not willing to be just one secondary part of our lives. He's not even willing to be the primary part of our lives. Jesus says, I am your life. He'll have all of you or nothing at all. He says, if anyone loves their mother or father or sister or brother more than me, then they are not worthy of me. Those are the demands that Jesus makes on our lives. Sometimes we want a Jesus that will just leave us as we are, but Jesus says, no, I'm going to I'm going to cut off all the branches in your life that don't bear fruit. I'm going to purify you so that your life looks like me. That's the Jesus of Scripture. That's the king that you need. Can I tell you something? You do not need a king who looks like you. And you don't need a king who looks like me. You don't need a king who looks like all of our Canadian cultural assumptions. You need the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And you need to take him on his terms. Because our false assumptions are dangerous and they'll keep us from experiencing his peace. If that's you, I would just encourage you to open up your Bible and see him for who he is. He's glorious. 
He's far more glorious than anything that you can concoct in your imagination. And unlike the the being of your imagination, this king has the power to save you. Now I want to move to our second warning because some people, the reason why they're not able to see and worship Christ is not because of their false assumptions. It's because people have put obstacles in their way. The second danger I want to highlight here is the cost of bad religion. Now I'm drawing this warning from the scene in the temple. As the Messiah King, Jesus gave himself permission to purify the temple. And when he came and he saw Gentile worshipers trying to pray, trying to worship the Lord, but being crowded around and and, and hearing merchants shouting in their ears, it, it infuriated Jesus. It filled him with this righteous anger. And we shouldn't be surprised by that because we see it elsewhere in the Gospels. Take, for example, Matthew 18, verse 6 which says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. As you study the Gospels, you'll come to learn that one of the things that makes Jesus particularly angry is when our sin and our foolishness obstruct people from coming to Christ. It makes them angry. And admittedly, Luke gives this two verses in this account. So this is not a major emphasis for Luke. But I just, as I was walking through the text this week, I felt God pressing this upon my heart. Because I feel like we have an opportunity in front of us. Now more than ever, our culture's looking for peace. And we know Jesus We have an opportunity to point them to Christ. But if they look at our lives and they're not seeing Jesus, then we have blown the opportunity. That's the cost of bad religion. And so I want to just press this in for the next minute or two. I want you to think about this and wrestle through this. Here's a question for you just to ask for yourself, for your marriage, and for us collectively as a church. Here's the question. When others look at your life, does it commend the gospel Or does it obstruct the gospel? Right? Does your life point people to Jesus? Or does your life make Jesus look like he's burdensome? Like he's not a joy to serve? Some of us have legalistic tendencies. And I've talked to young people who say that they were so so repulsed by the gospel But in reality, what they were pushed off by was the fact that mom and dad held their musical preferences and their preferences on what you should wear to church so firmly, so callously, legalistically, that it it made the gospel look like like a restriction. Don't let that be true of you, friends. On the flip side, some of us have so much lawlessness in our lives. We've we've indulged so much sin in our lives that people look at us and they come away thinking, Whatever the gospel is, it obviously doesn't have the power to change a person. We we cannot allow those things to linger in our lives and to obstruct people from seeing the gospel. I feel as if we are in a season when Jesus is, he's flipping the temple and he's purifying his people. I wonder if you're feeling that heat today. Think about our marriages. Ephesians chapter 5 says that Our marriages should tell the story of the gospel. People should be looking at at your relationship with your spouse and they should be seeing the way that Christ loves the church. They should be seeing love, self-sacrificing love, submission and honor and respect. I'm wondering, do they see that in your marriage? Are your children seeing that? I know that there are a lot of us right now who feel as if we're exposed There's no busyness to hide behind. Uh, There's no crowd to to tuck ourselves into. There's no children's ministry teacher to hand our children off to. Right now, our faith is exposed. Our marriage is exposed. And we've got to come to terms with who we really are. And church, can I tell you something? I think that is a tremendous blessing. I really do. If for the first time you're being helped to see that your marriage is not healthy, praise God. God. Because I'll tell you, your children already saw that. So it's good that you see it too. If for the first time you're seeing that your faith is stagnant and cold, 
Praise God. It's better that you be confronted with that now than spend the rest of your life turning people off to the gospel. God breaks us down so as to build us up. I love what what Augustine said. He said, when anyone knows that he is nothing in himself and has no help from himself, the weapons within himself are broken and the war is ended. It's good for us to be brought low. It's good for us to realize that we can't do this in our own strength. Are you feeling like you don't have the strength to fix your marriage? You don't. Or or, or that you don't have the strength to overcome that addiction or that you don't have the strength to, to stir up that fire in your soul for the Lord. The truth is this. You do not have that strength in your flesh. But if you have surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, then you have the spirit in you. Repent. And ask God to do what only he can do in your life. Because there is a great cost that comes with bad religion. We don't want the people that we love paying that cost. Because, and here's the the third thing that we learn in this text. We learn about the horrifying prospect of judgment. If I could, church, I just want to stop and I want to pray right now. This is weird because there's no one here looking at, I just need the Lord's help. So would you just pray with me? Heavenly Father, I just ask that you would help me to speak clearly and to, uh, to speak faithfully about what we see in this text, uh, about the warning that's here. And Lord, I just confess that uh, I need your grace to, to feel the urgency of this. Lord, I pray that you'd help me to see the, the eyes of, of our people uh, looking forward, uh, longing for salvation for their loved ones, Uh, maybe people sitting in the congregation who don't yet know you. I pray that in my mind's eye that I would see them now and that I would speak faithfully. And I just ask, Holy Spirit, that you would speak now through your words, speak through me, speak in our homes, clear away the distractions. Let us hear you today. Forgive me, Father, I should have prayed sooner. I I so need your strength and your grace in this. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Oh, the horrific judgment that Jerusalem experienced in the siege of AD 70 was the most gruesome chapter of Rome's gruesome history. That's what Jesus saw as he looked out over Jerusalem. But more than that, he saw the judgment that went beyond what happened in AD 70. He saw the eternal judgment that was reserved for all of those who would reject him as their king. And he wept. Only two times in scripture, are we told that Jesus wept? And this is one of them. Leon Morris explains, wept might be rendered wailed. Jesus burst into sobbing as he lamented lost opportunity. I want to speak candidly with you for a moment, church. It is very possible that there are people living on your street, living in your neighborhood, who, who will not survive this pandemic. And I know that that's, that's not a fun thing to say, and I'm not fear-mongering, I'm not, but we do need to be honest that there are people, vulnerable people on our streets who may not survive this pandemic. People who don't know Jesus, people who haven't heard this gospel, people who, who have not hidden themselves in the saving blood of Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us that if they have not surrendered their lives to Christ, that they are looking at eternal judgment. They are hanging over a precipice that will lead to the fires of hell. And I know that we don't like talking like that, but we need to because that's what Jesus said. Charles Spurgeon said this, and I need him to say this to me and to say this to us again. We need to hear this. He said, the more I look into the subject of the world to come, the more I am impressed that all those who would lessen our ideas of the judgment that God will bring upon the wicked are waging war against God and against virtue and the best interests of men. Why do we lie to ourselves about the reality of eternity? It's because we want to justify our inaction. We want to tell ourselves that it can't be true. But friends, Jesus, time and time again, said that this is true, that he is the only way to the Father. 
And that if we don't surrender our lives to him, we will stand before the Father with all of our sin still upon us. We have to point people to Jesus. Now, the reality of that, it should cause some weeping in the days to come. Jesus, perfect, merciful Savior Jesus, looked out over the city that would reject him. And he wept for them. He wailed for them. He sobbed for them. And so should we at the idea that any of these people that we love would spend an eternity apart from God. That should, that should make us weep. But, but then he goes further because Jesus didn't just continue weeping. What did he do next? He marched into the city. He purified the temple. He got rid of all of the junk that would keep people from worshiping God. And then he opened his mouth and he taught them. I would say that's the way forward for us right now. There should be some time in your home, in my home, when we weep over this horrific reality that might await some people that we love. That, just the idea that people would, would turn their back on this free offer of salvation, that should make us weep. But then we need to wipe the tears from our eyes and we need to cleanse the temple, right? Cleanse this temple. Get rid of all of the junk, all of the sin in my life that would keep people from seeing Christ in me. Take sin seriously and get rid of it. And then open your mouth and teach the gospel. Put signs up in your windows. Put cards in the mailboxes. It is not a mistake that God's got you on that street. And you just might be the way in which he's going to help somebody to see the salvation that is theirs in Christ. Church, let's take this very seriously. Because the Prince of Peace is inviting people into his peace. And we are his ambassadors. And now more than ever, we need to speak up. Because this is the last thing we see in the text. It's the, the invitation of the Prince of Peace. Now, perhaps you've been listening up until now and, and you have not surrendered your life to Jesus. If that's you, you've probably already turned off your computer. But if, if you're still with me, I would imagine you're asking the question, why would anybody give up so much to follow Jesus? Right, that's a, that's a fair question. If Jesus says, you know, you got to take up your cross, you're going to experience tribulation in this life. If you love me more than your father or your mother, you're not worthy of me. I can imagine you're asking the question, why would anyone do that? Well, I want to let Jesus answer that question today. Here's what he says. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Friends, Jesus is not offering you a bad trade. Jesus is saying, let go of these things that are temporary, these things that are fleeting, and receive everlasting life. That's the offer that Jesus has for you today. In an instant, your health, your job, your family, all these things that we, we lean on, we put our trust in, in an instant, they can all come crumbling out underneath us. Isn't that true? Sometimes just one big wave comes in and everything crumbles out from under us. And it is very disorienting when all of the things that we, we found our peace in previously come shaking under our feet. Those things will inevitably let you down because they are subject to all the wind and the waves, the same things that you're subject to. Those are good things, but they're not God things. So where can peace be found? It's found in the one who is Lord over the tempest. Peace is found in the only one who can walk on the waves. It's found in the only one who could speak and then the storms are stilled. And he's offering you that peace right now. He's the only one who can silence the thing that is causing all of the fear and the chaos that you're feeling today. See, there is pestilence that's wreaking havoc in the world, but it's far more dangerous than COVID-19. This world is being ravaged by sin. It's in our governments, it's in our businesses, it's in our neighborhoods, it's in our children. Moms and dads are starting to feel that this week. And it's in our hearts. 
It's the reason why lasting peace feels like it's out of reach. Sin condemns you in your conscience. I wonder if you're feeling that lately. It amplifies all of your fear and your anxiety. See, Jesus says, come to me, cast all your anxieties upon me. But the devil just turns up the dial. He wants you to feel that. Sin stirs up all that bitterness and resentment in you. It's the source of hopelessness. It's the force behind greed and lust and anger and everything else that you wish you didn't see in yourself, but you do. And worst of all, sin damns you to hell. Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. Jesus didn't come to overthrow the Romans, friends. He didn't come to heal us of COVID-19. He didn't come to restore the small business owner's business back to him. Now listen, there will come a day when Jesus will set all things right. Hallelujah, that is true. But 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to deliver you from the sin that would destroy you. For the wages of sin is death, the Bible says, but it goes on. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. He came to die for your sin. He came to offer a peace that will endure long after this world fades away. He came to purchase you out of slavery and he invites you now. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The Prince of Peace invites you today. Would you have his peace? You need to repent. Jesus came to Jerusalem, but they would not repent. They would not receive him. I, don't let that be you today. Repent. Identify all of that sin that you're seeing in yourself. Name it. The, the greed that you're seeing, the lust, the pride, the, the anxiety, the, all of it. You, you just, you confess it to the Lord. He sees it all anyways. But then here's the thing. I want you to keep confessing. I want you to confess this, that Jesus Christ is your Savior and Lord. Confess that he is your king, that he died in your place on the cross, that he set you free, that he took all of your sin. Listen, friends, he took all of it. He took your sins from, from your childhood. He took your sins from today. He's taken all of your sins from the future. If you've surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, then your sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, your sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross and you bear it no more. Praise the Lord. It can be well with your soul today. The Prince of Peace is offering this invitation. He wept over Jerusalem because he came and he knocked, but they did not receive him. Is he weeping over you today? Surrender your life to him. This is the invitation. This is the only way home. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just ask in Jesus' name that you would impress upon our hearts how beautiful it is that you have sent your Son to set us free. I know that there's, there's all kinds of people who are hearing this today. And so, Lord, I pray today for those who are just enjoying your peace, Lord, and I've spoken to many of them who, in the midst of all of this chaos, are just feeling the peace that is theirs in Christ. Thank you, God. I pray that they would feel more and more of that, that that peace would just exude out of them and the joy of the Lord would be evident in them. And God, that they would just be a shining light pointing people to you. God, strengthen them. I pray for those who are coming face to face with some things that, some things that are obstructing the image of Christ in them. Lord, I know that there are people today who are, who are feeling like their marriage is, is unhealthy, who are feeling like there's lingering sin in their life that they just can't seem to get rid of. And I just pray in Jesus' name that you would show them the freedom that they have in Christ. I pray that by your spirit, you would break the chains of sin that have been holding them. I pray that they would experience your forgiveness. I thank you that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let them experience the power of your love and, and break them free from those things that would obstruct others' view of you. Purify us, God, I pray. And lastly, God, I pray, if there's anyone listening right now who has not surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ, I pray that you would take this little sermon 
and that you would make so much more of it than what it is, that your word would go forth in power and that you would change hearts. God, that you would give them eyes to see and ears to hear because you will that none should perish. You've been patient. You're patiently waiting for them to surrender their lives to you. And I pray that today would be the day when you would take hold of them and transform their hearts once and for all, that they could be forgiven and set free. That is the invitation, God, and we thank you for it. We love you. We surrender ourselves to you. And we ask as we come into this holy week that we would keep our eyes fixed on you. Help us to see what we ought to see as we come to the cross once again. And then as we behold the empty tomb, we pray all of this in Jesus' mighty saving name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Pastor Jody, would you lead us? Jesus Christ is the way to peace. He is the Prince of Peace. He's the way home. That peace fills our lives. We trust Him. Let's sing together. Declare He is good.
Father, we praise you for these glorious thoughts and that our sin has been removed by Jesus Christ. Father, we praise you and we thank you that there is a way home through him. And we recognize him today as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Hosanna. Father, we thank you that you have come in the person of your son to save us. We thank you, Lord, there is deliverance, there's hope for every person. We put our trust in you today. Now, Lord, would you bless us and would you keep us and would you make your face to shine upon us, to be gracious to us, to give us your peace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen and amen. Thank you for watching this morning, for worshiping, for hearing God's word and letting God just to minister to you. And I want to remind you today that following this recorded service, at 1145 sharp, there is going to be a live Q&A. Uh, Pastor Paul will be hosting that on Facebook. And so if you're watching on the website or on YouTube, just go to Cornerstone Baptist on the Facebook page, and you should be able to find it there. And you can send us your prayer requests, send us your comments and your questions, and we'll be encouraged together. God bless you. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.